Hey, what's going on everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. The movies I want to take a look at right now are all of the A24 films that I have missed in the year of 2021. Now, I watched a few of them and reviewed them on my YouTube channel, the most prominent one being The Green Knight, one of my favorites. And so I realized by the end of the year, there was just a lot that I missed and people were talking about Red Rocket or At Zola, The Humans, Come On, Come On. And I, th I was thinking to myself, Wow, how incredibly lazy was I to miss these four movies. And so when I had access to these four films, I decided to watch them and review them for you all. I also decided to make this easier and not have four separate reviews and clicking on four separate videos or four separate podcasts. There's just no need for that. So I'm going to lump it all right here. You're going to get one nice little long A24 video, and I'm going to go through the four that I just mentioned at the top uh, of the ones that I missed from last year and just give you my thoughts on them and see if they have any awards chances. And we're just going to have like a, a nice little discussion here. So, um, yes, sorry this took so long to come out. Uh, I had some personal health issues. I'm back on my feet now. Um, but I wanted to get this out because I did watch these four before I took my break and I just thought it was a disservice that I didn't, you know, provide this, uh, information for you guys. So, um, yeah, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the A24 films that I have missed. But first of all, I would like to say A24 had a pretty a pretty good year. Uh, definitely some highs, definitely some whatevers, and definitely some lows. But then again, that's usually how that company runs, where they're going to have a couple that are standouts that they're really going to push for awards considerations, and then you're going to have a few that just go by the wayside or people just never talk about ever again. And so, you know, that's, that's the way it is every year. And that's the way it was in 2021. Okay. So one of the films that they, uh, they dropped, uh, last year that, you know, I think it was on a delay for a couple of years cause it was supposed to come out in 2020, but they kept pushing it obviously because of COVID. And so now it finally came out in the summertime at Zola. Now this one is actually based on a Twitter thread. Uh, that went viral for a little bit, and it was just this long, crazy story about one uh, stripper's night out with a friend and how crazy it, it got. I didn't read the full thread, so I had no context of the story or the characters, and so I was really intrigued to see how they were going to present that in a fictional film. And so this one tells the story of a, a stripper named Zola who embarks on a wild road trip to Florida, and she um, it's a friend that is is with her, kind of drags her along with it. And there's some other characters involved. Don't want to really get into that unless you want to kind of be surprised. But um, yeah, and so we just kind of see like what this road trip is all about and how insane it gets. I like this one. I think it is a deliciously dark comedy. There's also a lot of serious stuff in there that flips on a dime because of the performances and how tightly wound they are and just how... Uh, constructed this thing is and so the threat level is there but there's also a lot of darkly comedic things that make you giggle and laugh with just the absurdity of what's going on because this doesn't even feel like a real story it feels like someone's imagination running wild but it's so insane and the way it's just kind of like laid out and uh, the kind of testimony that Zola had online it's just like you can kind of believe it as well, but it's just so over the top and so ridiculous. It fits the kind of film aesthetic of being a dark comedy. But like I said, the performances are so in tune to these characters that even some of the the danger elements can flip on a dime like that and really have you invested um, for this character's safety and, and wanting her to get out alive. And, you know, that has to, like I said, it has to do with the performances. But in terms of visual component i really like the grainy look to it it makes florida pop a little bit more it's visually pleasing it's got that grainy kind of just rough texture around it kind of like some of these characters um everyone's kind of rough in this film and so it kind of fits with that it also makes it look vintage which is a really um just nice play on the eye so there's that um and this thing moves like a bullet it's you know it's an hour and 26 minutes long and I think which is the, the pure entertainment value that this film brings, I think it really, it, um, 
it warrants its runtime. Nothing is wasted, and it's just it, it, it flies by. And I, uh, I, I had a good time watching because, like I said, it's entertainment first, and I think it really delivered on that. But what really struck me were the performances. Um, the actress that plays Zola, Taylor Page, really great lead. I, I really just liked watching her to see like how she was going to interact with these people and just how she was going to take care of herself in the situations and how she was going to get out of everything. Like, really great character to follow. Riley Keno. If I if I had my opportunity to create a supporting actress ballot for the Oscars, she could be in consideration to be on that list. Uh, she is absolutely unhinged in this movie, and I 100,000 billion gazillion percent believed her character. She was so committed to the role, I was kind of blown away. And I've seen her in a lot of other projects where like, I've seen her range before and she's really good. This is the one where I was like, she can do whatever she wants now and I can't wait to see where her, her career goes. But she was absolutely just outstanding as the, uh, as the um, co-lead uh, uh, to Zola. And then of course, the other MVP, absolutely terrifying, Coleman Domingo. Th this guy... I've seen him in projects where he's like kind of this sweet, nurturing, older brother, mentor type, like in Euphoria. And then you have stuff like Candyman in this, where you're just like, I want to punch this guy in the face. He's so good at convincing you that he is evil that I could not, I could not look away. He commands your attention on screen. He commands you to watch this performance and he absolutely delivers. So all in all, I really like this one. It's a very entertaining one. As far as the prospects for like Academy Awards, I would put Riley Kino and Coleman Domingo for supporting actor and supporting actress. Maybe cinematography, but that's that's stretching it. It's mainly just those two, but I don't think it has a chance anywhere else. But that's just kind of my thoughts on at Zola. The next uh, A24 film that I missed that I would like to discuss is The Humans. Now, this one is actually based on a play. And it's uh, set inside a pre-war duplex in downtown Manhattan. The Humans follows the course of an evening in which the Blake family gathers to celebrate Thanksgiving. Excuse me. As darkness falls outside the crumbling building, mysterious things start to go bump in the night and family tensions reach a boiling point. So I mentioned that it was based on a play. And it definitely shows. And that I mean that in the best compliment possible. Usually when stuff is adapted from stage plays or Broadway or whatever, there is a certain style to it. It's very it's very laid out like a stage. It's very coordinated and very it's blocked like a stage play. Everything is self-contained. People are overlapping each other with dialogue. Things are, are, are hitting certain points like perfectly. Like people are standing and moving and it's just you can definitely, there's a, a, a certain synchronic energy to something that's adapted from a stage play because everything has to hit its mark and everything has to kind of seem very manufactured and kind of factory-like. But that's also kind of the, I guess, the, the good thing about this type of story is that it's constantly moving. It's constantly having characters combat one another with ideas and conversations and you're kind of just interested in the family dynamic and just everyone uh, having their thoughts spewed out at all times. And that's kind of the whole point is that since they're stuck underneath this roof, everyone's just kind of spilling out everything towards each other, the good and the bad. And I think that's what makes a family dynamic. And I think that's what makes a family a family is showing the good and the bad side of everything. And the whole thing with this story is that it leads up to this emotional climax at the very, very end. And then it just cuts to credits and it kind of just, it leaves you sitting there kind of thinking about what, what the characters have said. Like what, what lessons have they learned? Like where are they going to go from here? What does the future hold for these types of people? And so um, just the, the dialogue and just the, the performances really kind of carrying this narrative to really just make you interested in these characters and just their, their problems and their struggles and all that stuff. It, it was really, really f like, not, I wouldn't say fun. It was definitely um, uh, depressing in some parts, but definitely a, an interesting watch.
to really just kind of see like where um, these conversations would go, where they're going to lead to, and where that breaking point is going to be. Uh, everyone in this movie is good, and it, it is um, quite the cast. Um, Richard Jenkins, Amy Schumer, Stephen uh, Ian, um, Beanie Feldstein, June Squibb, like, what kind of group is this? It's so random, but that it gives each person a chance to shine. No one's overstepping each other. And I think everyone has their moment in this that I was really just kind of impressed by and really kind of seeing, um, like I said, each, each person's dynamic and just how they, they kind of came together. There's a lot of, um, characters that don't really agree with each other, but I, I still like their camaraderie. I still like their chemistry. It felt like a very organic family. It felt like, someone uh, a family coming together for thanksgiving and just um just talking stuff out and you know when you get to that like kind of emotional climax at the very very end and also i must i must add the cinematography isn't really like anything to behold in this there's a lot of like long takes uh so a lot of room for the actors to breathe within the scene so the cinematography is not like anything like spectacular there's a couple of things that were really impressive but that final shot was it was so perfectly it encapsulates like the, just the, the mood and the atmosphere of like what these people are going through. I thought that was so impressive and it left on such a high note. That's why I kind of sat there and thought about it for a little bit because of just the, the way it ends with the characters um, and the shot and just the, the situation, the dialogue, all that. It was, it was a perfect ending to this film. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is a, it's a film that lets the actors breathe a little bit and just let let them let them loose the it lets them have the conversations and it feels like this organic um, situation. It doesn't feel like there's dialogue that's written for these people. It feels like they're just you know speaking from the heart and I, I really enjoy that. So it just adds to the authenticity of it. So is it one of my favorites from May twenty four last year? No, um, but I. I enjoyed it for what it was. Um, I wouldn't mind rewatching it again to maybe kind of uh, dissect it a little bit more and kind of really understand things um, like from certain characters. Cause it, like I said, it moves at a bullet. Um, like I said, people are talking constantly talking over each other, but that's usually how stage plays are. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't mind rewatching it, but if you're looking for, um, movies that are set in one location or movies that are adapted from stage plays or if you're a fan of the stage play and you want to watch the movie, give it a shot. I think you'll really like it. I um, And one of my other complaints with it, it's not really a complaint, it's just more of a selfish thing. I wanted to see more because it ends on such a high note or a low note for some of these people that I wanted to see where they go from there. So that would be my only complaint is like, I, I, it was getting really good. It hits that point and then it just ends. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, that I think, uh, if this is right up your alley, I think you'll really enjoy it. Does this have awards play? Maybe screenplay. Um, maybe adapted. That's probably my only bet for it, but I wouldn't hold my breath out. Um, you know, I, I think the, the performances are good, but I don't think they're like at that point where like, I can be like, oh yeah, I, I would want these people to be nominated. Um, it's just one of those things to where like I appreciate what I saw, but I wouldn't really go beyond that. But adapted screenplay, I would give the the nod to. The next day, twenty four film I want to talk about that I missed that I've been super excited about because I'm a huge fan of Joaquin Phoenix, um, and I'm a huge fan of just whatever uh, he wants to do in his career, whether it be a, a blockbuster indie hybrid like Joker or these smaller films like Come On, Come On, and he he can do whatever he wants. I, I've been a huge fan of him ever since I was kind of blown away when I saw Signs uh, back in 2002. So yeah, I was 12 years old. I was aware of him, but I wasn't like aware of like the impact that he had in film until I saw that movie. So huge fan of him. Heard a lot of great things about this one, especially from um, director and writer Mike Mills and from Woody Norman, who plays the uh, his nephew in the film. So let's go ahead and uh, break down. Come on, come on. When his sister asks him to look after her son, a radio journalist embarks on a cross-country trip with his energetic nephew to show him life away from Los Angeles. 
So in the film, Joaquin Phoenix is kind of a podcaster. He goes around the country asking kids um, just their viewpoint on life because kids and adults have different um, stances on things. Kids are, are new to the world. They don't understand why things are the way they are. They don't understand why there is so much you know, hatred or, or just um, sadness. Like they, they can't comprehend that. And adults you know, they have the opposite opinion. And so having this kind of perspective of like, what does a kid think of just basic things is really fascinating. And that's kind of like interspliced with the story. Well, also we have him reconnecting with his nephew and having this bond in this relationship that it seems like was kind of lost or kind of in tethers, especially with him and his sister as well. So he's trying to, you know, become that, that uncle that this kid has, has always wanted while also kind of showing him, you know, what his job is like and like, we just like what the world is like and just kind of showing him what life is all about, what it means to be human, what it means to feel, what it means to emote. And that's really important. Um, since he doesn't really have a strong father figure in his life and his uncle is the closest thing to that. This film is absolutely beautiful. In every sense of the word. Yes, to get it out of the way, the black and white cinematography, gorgeous. It's it's wonderful. When they have, you know, the settings in LA, it's it's beautiful, it's warm, it's inviting, it just it it has like this warm sensibility to it, just like the characters. It's very inviting, right? Then when they get to New York, it's a you know, there's a lot more um a lot more uh congestedness with like the buildings and like the people it's it's just a different vibe it's a different atmosphere and it really just kind of captures that and it's raw just kind of energetic form the cinematography is gorgeous and there's a lot of wide shots that are just just uh just beautiful in the way they're presented and you can you can freeze frame them and making them into a still still picture and hang it up on your wall it's just it's really good stuff And, and making it black and white and not in color, I thought was a genius move because it really kind of, it strips all of the kind of like vibrancy of life and strips it down to like the bare essentials, which is, you know, humanity and just like what what it means to be, be here and like, and feel in the moment. And it's not about the surroundings. It's, it's about the people that we connect with and all that stuff. And so I thought maybe, maybe I'm just stretching Maybe that's not what Mike Mills was going for, but I think stripping the color away and getting down to like basics um, really just kind of showcases the actual true intention behind this film and like what it's trying to come across. Um, So I I thought the black and white kind of cinematography aesthetic was really, really well handled. The story itself is really, it's emotional. It's, it's really heavy. It's really sweet. It's honest it's it's sad it's happy it's got this wide range of emotions that it takes you through and it's a really just kind of satisfying journey as a human being to watch these characters go through the ups and downs of this relationship you know hearing the perspectives of other kids hearing the perspective of his nephew his sister why they're going through so much pain of grief and loss and it's just it's just a very like I said, a very just human film. And it really just kind of taps into all types of emotional gridlocks that some of us might hold that we have a hard time expressing. And I think this film also teaches you that on how to approach situations and how to uh, be vulnerable. Be it, it's, okay to, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to smile. It's, it's okay to do these things. Um, and so I think having that kind of like abrasive approach and really just like in your face, like these are the types of emotions that people go through. It is okay to express them. And I I think, you know, Joaquin Phoenix teaching Woody Norman that in the movie was just, it was just a really just wonderful thing. And it really just gave me a lot of hope after the movie was done. It it gave me hope for the characters, which they're, they're fictional characters, but it gave me hope for them and striking up their relationship and having it stronger than ever 
it gave me hope as just someone that watched the movie and wants to do better in my life. So I, I got to thank Mike Mills on that. It is an impressive just piece of work um, to really just kind of be vulnerable and just show what it means to be human. And, uh, and like I said, I, I really like the perspective of like the kids and like having him interview the kids on like, you know, what is love? What is, what is lost? And what do you think of climate change? You know, just stuff like that. It's just, it's interesting to hear someone who is 20 years, 30 years younger than you explain like, I don't understand why it is this this way. Why can it be this? It makes you ask questions. It makes you question life. It makes you question, like you know, what are uh, our motives here on Earth? What what is what are our purposes? Like like why are we doing things that harm other people? It's just it's just stuff like that that just it makes it such a genuine and positive experience. And Mike Mills did that. And the, like I said, the he wrote and directed it as well. Not only is it crafted. Just like this beautiful painting, uh, story-wise, character-wise, and cinematography-wise. But the dialogue is just also potent as well. It's just such a well-written script. And the performances are so heartfelt as well. Joaquin Phoenix can do no wrong in my eyes. He's made some so-so movies, but he commits 110% no matter what movie he's in. This is no exception. He's absolutely divine in this one. So is uh, Gabby Hoffman, who plays his sister a really kind of just emotionally potent role that's kind of the uh, defi defibrillator. Is that the thing that goes on your chest when they give you this shock? She is the emotional injection for Joaquin Phoenix's character because he's a lost person. He's got a lot of baggage on him and she's the one that kind of like gets him out of it and like tells him like, this is your situation now. You have a nephew, you have me, you need to figure yourself out. And you need to understand, like, there's people in your life that care about you, and you're harming them. You're harming yourself with, like, this emotional baggage. You need to you need to get it fixed. And so I, I kind of like that that positive reinforcement that they have on one another as siblings. It's really great stuff. And then Woody Norman. Wh Listen, child performances are tricky because most of them, not that good. Um, but then there are some that come along that are just so good, it makes you uh, excited about what they're going to do in the future. Woody Norman is no exception. He is absolutely wonderful in this one. He is, he, he, he acts like a kid. It feels like a kid performance, but like there's a lot of um, authenticity with it. Like it doesn't feel like he's being like this bratty little kid and like there's no like substance to it. Like, he plays it so well and like he, he plays it so organically that I just uh, I was entranced by what he could do and how he can go toe to toe with Gabby Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix. He was definitely the glue of this entire film, especially with these you know the two uh, sibling characters. He's the heart of it. And so uh, yeah, I, I really love this one. Um, I, I think about it quite a bit and I wouldn't mind rewatching it again. As far as awards uh, chances, this one I can actually see going semi-far um, with certain things. Mike Mills for uh, screenplay, for best original screenplay. I think he might have a chance for director, maybe. Joaquin Phoenix for actor. Woody Norman for supporting actor. Even Gabby Hoffman for supporting actress. Cinematography. Sound mixing. The... Um, just the the way this this movie sounds, and it sounds like an old tape recording, not with just the podcast interviews, but just in general, it feels like this um, this lost relic of footage that were were being like replayed into our ears, uh, and I really like that kind of artistic choice to make it feel like this um, this long lost audio tape. So I think sound mixing has a chance. Um, I'm looking at the back here of like what they're trying to push for uh, awards consideration. Yeah, film editing. I, I put I would put uh, editing it, editing in there. Yeah, they definitely have sound mixing and stuff and sound editing and score. So I, I think this one actually has a pretty good shot at being nominated for a bunch of different things. It's probably the the most likely one out of the bunch that I'm talking about with like the most nominations. But come on, come on, is a really really great one. Check that one out if you missed it. 
And the last A24 film that's getting a lot of um, things talked about it, uh, I'll discuss it here. I have not seen the other one that's being compared to. That will be um, uh, on a later video. But the last one I want to talk about is Red Rocket. This one focuses on Mikey Saber, played by uh, Simon Rex. He is a washed-up porn star who returns to his small town in Texas. Not that anyone really wants him back. I love that IMDb description. Uh, definitely kind of like a, a carefree, kind of douchey attitude. Fits perfectly with that character. So going into this, I was... I was kind of excited because it's directed by Sean Baker and he previously did the Florida project, uh, you know, Willem Dafoe and uh, Brooklyn Prince. Really nice movie. Um, what was it? 2018. It's been a long time since Sean Baker's last film, but I've always kind of liked his kind of like rough around the edges, like small town kind of like, you know, small character kind of perspective and just really kind of focusing on, um, how they interact with people around the town and just making it feel lively and lived in and, you know, showcasing characters with a lot of problems and just, you know, um, uh, really just kind of showing the underbelly of like small towns and stuff. And me being in Texas, I can tell you right now that this movie pretty much describes a lot of small towns uh, in Texas. I even grew up in one that was, it wasn't like small like this, but we had small towns around it that it kind of reminded me of that. So I think the uh, potency of showcasing like what a small town in Texas is like, Sean Baker, good job. I approve. But um, this was a really good one. Um, I don't know if I necessarily love it, and I don't know if it would be near as good if Simon Rex was not as phenomenal as he is. Simon Rex is the absolute driving force behind this movie. This character, this character is disgusting. He stabs people in the back. He is conniving. He is selfish. He gets what he wants whenever he wants because that's how, that's how he thinks. He leaves a path of destruction behind. Why follow this character? It's a fascinating character study. I'll tell you that much. Um, I was glued to the screen watching this man uh, balance depravity and sweetness all at once. And that takes a hell of a performer to pull that off. And Simon Rex absolutely delivered. This man was juggling a thousand things at once, making us feel somewhat sorry for him, then taking it right back and making us want to punch him in the face. Then he'll go right back and it's just like, he's starting to convince me that he, he's going to change things around. And like, even the character at a certain point in the movie was just like, yeah, you're really good at convincing people that you'll change and stuff. And he did that to me because he has that capability and that range as an actor to convince you otherwise. And I absolutely loved it. And he, it's such a fearless performance. There's a lot of things in this that feel unplanned, feel um, untethered. And just kind of wild. And he rolls with it. There's a lot of things that happened in certain scenes where you can definitely tell it wasn't planned. And he just rolls with the punch anyways. He's just like, hey, the camera's still rolling. I'm going to go ahead and just be my character and just keep the scene going. And that adds such a, a grounded nature to his character. And it's just an absolute dynamite performance. Um, there's even a, I, w I was even hoping when watching this there would be a couple times where I get to see that Simon Rex um, that I've never seen before. And there was a couple times where I looked that man in his eyes while watching this, and I was like, yeah, that, that was a really great scene. That's your Oscar clip right there. So I cannot, I cannot say how much I, I really adore his performance. It's just, it's all over the place. It's controlled at the same time. He lives that character. He breathes it. It's, it's really great stuff. And that is the only thing, uh, maybe screenplay, but that's the only thing I would actually think that would be dominated from this film is best actor for Simon Rex. Um, speaking of everyone else in the movie, everyone else is great. It feels like 
they aren't even actors or actresses. It feels like we we literally just went to this small town and we just started filming it. Excuse me. And um, they just happen to be on camera and they're just like, hey, just interact with this person. It's just it feels like a documentary. At sometimes it just feels um, too real <laughs> to where it doesn't even feel like it's actors um, portraying anyone. So I, I really like that to the authenticity. It's shot really well. It's beautiful, just like other Sean Baker films, really um, showcasing warm colors and just the the environment and just um, just showcasing just everything he can within a scene, whether it be buildings or, or grass or people. It's just, it's, it's very luscious environments. And this is no different. To comment on the, uh, the story a little bit, because I know a lot of people are, First of all, licorice pizza is being thrown under the bus because of the age gap thing. This one also has an age gap relationship. I, I just want to say this, like Sean Baker's intent for this is not to show that this is okay. Um, very much what Mikey is doing is pretty bad. Um, and it's it's shown that way. It's shown that this is, this is not a good situation. Now... Uh, and so it, it's presented in that way to where I didn't feel like, you know, oh my God, they're endorsing these kind of like really bad age gap relationships. I mean, cause this man's like in his forties, um, he's dating a 17 year old in the movie. Unfortunately, that is the age of consent in, in Texas, whatever. But, um, <laughs> that should be definitely changed. But, um, in, in the film, it's, it's shown right off the bat that this is just a bad idea and he's manipulating this person and, and her dreams and just getting what he wants and how he can get back into the porn business. It's disgusting behavior. But like you're just so fascinated as to how this guy even exists and how how he hasn't... Um, how, he, how he survived all these years just by being a, a, a con man like this. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think this film endorses that in any way, shape, or form. So I just want to throw that out there. And also, what's fascinating is the end of the film. It's kind of open-ended. You don't really know if like any of this was actually true. So it could have been it could have all been in his head for all we know. It could have been like this fantasy that he constructed because he's down such a dark path in his life that this is the only way to get him out of it is to fantasize about something that's not even real. So there's that. It, it it's very it's very possible that the end of the film could explain the fact that what we were actually seeing was not even true. And it's a man going through like this midlife crisis and being alone and being shut off from everyone in the world. And that's even a more satisfying ending for him because he kind of gets what he deserves. So um, that's just kind of my comprehension of that. But I, I, I appreciated the ending cause I didn't even see it coming. I was like, Oh, a little ambiguous ending. All right. So, yeah, um, it, it's uh, and also it's 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 really funny. Um, there's a lot of great dramatic elements too, um, and I, I think committing to both of those types of genres and tones really works for this type of character because he's all over the place. He's unhinged. You don't know what he's going to do next. He could break down in one scene, and you could feel really bad for him. Then he could do something stupid and moronic in the next scene, and do something disgusted, disgusting in the next scene. And so that's kind of the the roller coaster ride that. Mikey Saber, a.k.a. Simon Rex, takes you on, and Sean Baker takes you on as well. I really like this one, and I wouldn't mind rewatching it just to um, kind of dissect his performance a little bit more, but I think that is the only chance it has for award, awards consideration, so that's just kind of my thoughts on that. But that will do it, guys. Uh, my catch-up for the A24 films of 2021. Um, pleasure to talk about all like this in one fail swoop, uh, instead of clicking on four separate things, you get one giant thing. But uh, let me know down below out of these four, which one you've actually liked the most. If I had to rank them right now, live in front of you guys, Come On, Come On was my favorite, then Red Rocket, then At Zola, then The Humans. But you know what? All good films. Uh, I don't, there, there wasn't one in here where I was like, oh, that was terrible or trash. Get out of here. But uh, yeah, let me know down below what you thought of these four films and that will do it for these reviews, guys. I'm Chase Lee and tune in next time for whatever I review next. I think, don't hold me to it, but I think I'm going to do a Matrix Resurrections and Licorice Pizza combo review um, at some point. 
probably do an anticipated films of the year list. Maybe Belfast, maybe The French Dispatch. A lot of stuff i got to catch up on. But um, in the meantime, before all the, the big stuff hits, um, I'll, I'll just do a lot of catch up. So let me know down below about these four films. My name is Chase. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.